Welcome to Common Ground Discourse, everyone. Uh, this is uh, episode eight, and we're your co-hosts. My name is Shane Spore. Godspeace. I am Brother Kenneth. So in this episode, we are picking up on our discussion on uh, Sam Harris's book, The Moral Landscape. And again, a quick background with Sam Harris. He has his PhD in neuroscience, and he has a degree in philosophy as well, and is the co-founder and uh, one of the chairmen for Project Reason. So... <clears throat> Now we're getting into uh, good and evil, and uh, this is obviously a big section of the book. Is if you're going to talk about morality, you have to at least define what good and evil is. Uh, so to give a background on Harris's definition for good and evil, uh, good or good results or the good life is one where you are conducting yourself in such a way that contributes towards net positive outcomes for human happiness, well-being, flourishing. Anything that's away from suffering, and then which that's what what bad is. Uh, bad is the worst possible misery that anyone can experience for as long as they possibly can experience it. And evil is whoever would be the individual or or society or whatever that would put us in that situation. So in this in this chapter, I found some salient points of the text that I want to bring up. And then we can just go ahead and start wrestling with our definitions of, of good and evil there. Uh, the chapter more or less opens up with stating that the problem of human cooperation seems almost the only problem we're thinking about. Ethics and morality are the names we give to our deliberate thinking on these matters. And moral concerns translate into facts about how our thoughts and behaviors affect the well-being of conscious creatures like ourselves. If there are facts to be known about the well-being of such creatures, such as health, then there must be right and wrong answers from all questions. And he, he acknowledges that this can, uh, subscribes him to two methods of moral thought, one being moral realism, and that there are claims that can be true or false about morality, and a form of consequentialism. The rightness of an act depends on how it impacts the well-being of us. Um, parts of that, all questions of value depend upon the possibility of experiencing such value, and to say that an act is morally necessary or evil or blameless is to make tacit claims about its consequences in the lives of conscious creatures, either uh, actual or potential. So does a specific action or way of thinking have an effect on a person's well-being and or the well-being of others? There may be that we can eventually learn about the biology of such effects, which are determined by factors such as genetic, environmental, social, cognitive, political, economic, etc. Morality can be linked directly to the facts about happiness and suffering of conscious creatures. And all of this, it goes back to that definition of good and bad, flourishing and suffering on this moral landscape. So with the points that he's brought up here, it, it seems to me that when he says good or bad, it can sometimes pertain to the thoughts of what is a good thought, morally speaking, or a bad thought, but more so it's... Uh, what, what is the consequence of, of these actions? Where is it placing us? And that is what is good. What is a good life? What is a bad life? What do those details look like? And he's making the argument that we rope a science of morality or we develop a science of morality that should tell us what we should do and want, as well as what other people should do and want. Um, what is your, your comment on that? I know this is a, that was a lot to open up with. Yeah, well, I mean... His idea of what defines good and bad, and subsequently what defines evil, anything that's doing bad, mm -hmm. you would find that in secular or religious circles. Mm -hmm. The only difference in what would really define good or bad when you start entering into the theist circles is whether or not this is a, a tenant of the religion. Has it been defined by the religious authority has it been defined by God as something you should or should not do. That becomes the qualifier of good or bad in some things. Should you kill? No, because God said don't kill. Mm -hmm. You still wind up with the same end that Harris would say, should you kill? No, because that's minimizing the well-being of a conscious creature. Mm -hmm. uh, Harris does make a point along that line to throw religion out. and He's very clear about this, that... In his argument, and I, I want to be precise sure. with Dr. Harris on this to be sure that we know exactly where he's coming from on it. Um, 
He says, because most religions conceive of morality as a matter of being obedient to the word of God, generally for the sake of receiving a supernatural reward, and that's a big thing for him in religion, that you're doing this because you're going to be rewarded later on, mm -hmm. not now. Their precepts often have nothing to do with maximizing well-being in this world. Mm -hmm. Religious believers can, therefore, assert the immorality of contraception, masturbation, homosexuality, etc., without ever feeling obliged to argue that these practices actually cause suffering. Mm -hmm. So when he throws out religion at this point, with his definition, it's fair, because you're no longer considering the effect of human suffering. You're only considering whether or not someone has told you it is right or wrong. Mm -hmm. If we look at the uh, stages of moral development, this goes down back to the authority. I do it because I've been told to do it, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, my problem with his argument in this is it's a fairly narrow view of what religion has to offer as far as its definition of right or wrong, or good and bad. And in effect, it's as is common with his and the other four horsemen's arguments against religion, it's a straw man effect. It's a straw man argument because you've picked such a narrow view of religion that it's easy to pick apart. But there are other ways to look at right and wrong that are not necessarily God told me so, so I can go to heaven. Uh, there are other aspects of religion in that if you recognize the divinity in yourself as you do in another person, then that is recognizing um, the good in that person, not necessarily because God told you so, but because you are connected to that person. Religiously speaking, that is a degree of uh, theosis, mm -hmm. recognizing your divinity in others. Uh, secularly speaking, we call that empathy two sides of the same coin, but you both recognize that uh, the good of the other is connected to your good, and vice versa. You don't have to throw out religion to get there, um, nor do you, nor should you throw out religion just because others believe God said so. Um, there are plenty of other people in a secular standpoint that do or define right or wrong, not because religion told them to, but because mom and dad told them to because school told you to, because society tells you to, because the laws tell me I'm not supposed to do this, therefore it's right or wrong. Again, going back to Colbert's moral thinking, my definition of right or wrong is dependent on whether I'm rewarded or uh, society has told me or whether or not there's a universal right. So there are variances mm -hmm. in those degrees. Uh, I think his, uh, his issue with religion and I'd like to tackle this maybe three parts here. Uh, one that he that he makes, it, he, he's obviously not trying to throw out all religion, or he's not concerned with all religions. And he's made examples with the you know Jains. If there's an extreme Jain, we really have nothing to worry about in terms of well-being. And he's made those examples outside. Sure, he makes no example in here. Well, he, in his book, yeah, he yeah. is clearly saying that's true. And I, be interested to dig through to see if he brings it up once. I'd be surprised if he didn't bring it up once. He's just he's brought it in every lecture he's given surrounding the moral landscape. He does bring it up. Um, that aside, uh, so there are obvious religions that he's acknowledged. There are religions that there we have no concern. Um, another thing is, is I wonder if he is really trying to point out the truly damaging dogmas in religion that aren't questioned because inherently everything that you're told from a superior being uh, is inherently good, is right, and you can't determine if what God is saying is right or wrong. Who are you to say that the commands of a, of a supernatural being are bad, and if the scripture says to follow it, you have no choice. And, and that leads to the, the last bit, that there seems to be a contingent uh, conscious concern here of, of consciousness obviously once you die and there's a natural life you're still experiencing something in, in that realm that you experience here consciously there, there's a hopeful reward that every every picture for the the good life after life obviously has these attractive qualities and that i think is where he's he will get into the net positives of everything. If it truly is good in the long run to live a life full of misery and suffering, 
then we can still say that that is going to be the, the best way to live. It's just, it gets hard to talk about that because if we're trying to convert this into a science, there's no way to really get to that bit. And, and there's, he goes more into this argument in difference of the lectures that he gives, and he doesn't really go so much into it in the book, so I don't want to go into that, the consciousness passing on to another. Right. Right. And, and two, I think it was your second point, mm -hmm. you know, because God says that you can't argue with. Mm -hmm. For the premise of his thesis, he would have to throw that aspect of religion at any way. Because to be able to define morality in a scientific means means that you have something objective that you can engage in, and scientifically you can challenge like you would any thesis. Sure. Um, if your ultimate argument is because God said so, you can't argue God. You can't sit down with God over coffee and say, God, so when you told us not to touch ourselves, yeah. what were you thinking? You know, you yeah. say so you can't do that. And well, someone, I like, th someone like you can say that. Right. You, you think about these things and you, right. and you tackle them honestly and courageously for that matter. But there are those out there, and I think, again, it's the easy target for Harris, um, for those who don't think that way, that put on the blinders and will commit uh, horrendous acts in the name of doing something they believe will give them reward. Right. And the idea that because uh, for the longest time religion has been a sacred uh, area of inquiry that we should not challenge it in that way, that, that we have to tolerate all religious ideologies mm -hmm. for the sake of it just being religion, uh, that gets dangerous in terms of our efforts to uh, progress ourselves into a society globally, even for well-being. And we all know the one branch of religion that he continuously tries to Assault, and he's writing more books on on that as well. Right. That aside, I don't want to get too much into that. Um, but when we're trying to define uh, good and evil, uh, I think it's it's you have to bring up religion in that sense, uh, which is why I think he, he if he does bring it up, he tackles the ones that are easier to throw out. Right. You know, I don't know. I don't know if he would spend much time trying to debate whether or not the decisions of an Episcopal order are going to contribute towards well-being or suffering, because there's been no reason to believe that it, it would create a significant impact for terror, for right. example. Um, so that's the only reason why I think that he throws it out in terms of that it, at its most extreme, we shouldn't take it seriously in that it has anything to offer us that we're going to be stepping towards global well-being, for the sake of his argument of the moral landscape. Right. Um, or, in that case, I'm sorry, I should retract that. We should take it seriously, because if we don't challenge it, mm -hmm. it, it we're going to allow uh, those kind of acts that are that go against the greater good. Yeah. If we were to borrow, as we've done before, Fowler's stages of faith, sure. yeah. use his language, I would go along with Harris in so much as rather than throwing out religion mm -hmm. or religions at all, um, the ones that are removed from the argument or become at least a problem for the for the discussion because they don't engage in that part of the discussion mm -hmm. are those that are stage two and stage three. Yes. They're wholly stage yeah. two and stage three because they are defined by the definition of that stage either stage two defined by their religious narrative or stage three defined by their religious institution and what they're told. And that regard, the cognitive dissonance that ever arises from personal experience versus teaching will always bow down to the teaching until you hit stage four and you finally start questioning. So if we're looking at those that are fundamentalist, that those that are more dogmatic in their religion, stage two and stage three, those would cause a problem for this kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. And truth be told, they also cause a problem within their denominations themselves because stage two and stage three individuals within a specific denomination, even the Catholic Church, um, you have a divide in that thinking, whether or not you should have um, married priests or single priests and celibate priests. Has God told us? Can we question this? Well, if God says it, as the Pope said it, um, 
as our tradition said it, what are we allowed to question? Those that are more dogmatic say you can't question it, hands off. Others are still trying to engage it. And I think for Harris's sake, and I would side with him on this, the only way that you're going to come up with advanced morality is when you are willing to question it. Yeah. If you already come to the argument or the discussion saying there are some things we can't question, then you've already defeated the purpose. Yeah. Uh, so, for his purpose, that we have to be in conversation that is open-ended, those aspects of religion can be removed. I think for those aspects of religion that are open to conversation, we need not throw the baby out with proverbial bathwater yeah. again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, th I think it's important, too, that um, we don't throw it out, even internally, uh, at least religions should feel, or people of a particular religion, should feel confident enough to have that conversation, even within their own right. denomination, yeah. which uh, that would be more beneficial, I think, than just throwing it away and disregarding it, rather than encouraging that kind of conversation to take place. Yeah. And if, for example, we, we take an entire branch, let's say, of Christianity, and we know that there are some denominations that uh, will support Sam's idea of moving towards well-being and flourishing more than others will. How do you have that kind of conversation to point internally and say what we're doing that even by doctrine may seem good is actually evil? And how do we progress that way as a society? And what would your advice be to even those watching? Right. Part of branches that we know are causing harm uh, to others either psychologically or physically across the world, what would your advice be to those? This is one of those very delicate pastoral moments mm -hmm. that when speaking to those that are dogmatic, those that are fundamentalist, mm -hmm. um, and trying to encourage them to question teaching. As Fowler points out, it goes against everything that is at that stage anyway. Mm -hmm. And that when even presented with the opportunity or the invitation, the defenses are already up, they can't do it. So at some point I wonder if it's if it's even necessary, realizing that the defense is there and you can't get through it. Mm -hmm. um, but for the hope of the advancement of all religions to a more mature state of well-being, and you know, I say morality, mm -hmm. um, for those that find this a difficult situation, how can I question the tenets of God? How can I question the teachings of my religion? The wedge that I find that typically starts that process, the first wedge that works, is to go ahead and sit with and recognize the contradictions and the paradoxes that run rampant in every religion. If you sit down with Holy Scripture, whether it be uh, Torah and Tanakh, whether it be the Bible, Old and New Testaments, whether it be Al-Quran or the Hadith, any of these, you will find contradictions. Mm -hmm. And to be open and honest with them and recognize that limit is the beginning that allows you to question what comes after. Mm -hmm. And then to give you the promise that just because there is a paradox, just because there is a contradiction, just because you can question what a religion says at that time, does not falsify the entirety of faith or belief. That it's taking that first step and discovering that it's okay to question can be the most frightening. But once you get into it and you experience and realizing that the house won't fall apart when you do it, um, then you gradually move into it. But it's taking that first step with the assurity that it can be okay. Uh, so that's what I'd offer. Okay. And I think it helps to truly understand uh, good and evil with one's efforts to understand it rather than mm -hmm. just being told. Yeah. Which is, I think, if we had to sum it up, and if I'm sure if we challenged him at it, that's probably what you would draw a conclusion to. Um, uh, with this being said, I want to get into another part of the book here uh, in this chapter, 
uh, and it's a bit the question that he poses: Can we ever be right about right or wrong? And I'll uh, read some of the text as well. Uh, taking humanity as a whole, uh, Harris is quite certain that there is a greater consensus that cruelty is wrong, and then the passage of time varies with velocity, or that humans and lobsters share a common ancestor. Should we doubt whether there is a fact of the matter with respect to these physical and biological truth claims? Is the general ignorance about the special theory of relativity or the, the pervasive uh, disinclination of, of Americans to accept the scientific consensus on evolution put our scientific worldview even slightly in question? Uh, and he brings up another philosopher and neuroscientist, uh, Joshua Green. And it promotes the following conclusion that if you want to make sense of your moral sense, turn to biology, psychology, and sociology, not normative ethics. Uh, and to finish it off, total uniform, uniformity in the moral sphere may be hopeless. So what? This is the lack of closure we face in all areas of human knowledge. Full consensus only exists in the limit, at a hypothetical end of inquiry. Why not tolerate the same open-mindedness in our thinking about human well-being? So again, this wraps it up. Can we ever be right? Or right or wrong? And I think we have to grant ourselves that we can, especially if we're going to look at this as a moral science. And again, we, I think for the sake of this conversation, we have to at least grant him that, mm -hmm. that uh, there is a possible framework that, that can describe morality from a scientific point of view. And, and, and science can perhaps tell us what we should do and what we should value. Um, but if we get to that point, can we ever be right about that? What are, your, what are your thoughts on his portion of this chapter? As I said in the previous yeah. episode, when you're looking at big things, then absolutely, I think you can be right about right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is something we should not do. This is something we should do. When you get down into the more mundane decisions of life, or the more difficult situations, if I have two starving refugees and I have only so much food to whom do I do food? Mm -hmm. How do I make that decision? Again, when you go down to the dilemma, when there is no ultimate right or wrong answer, because one will always have a poor outcome or negative consequence. I don't know if we can fundamentally be right or wrong about that. But I think to his point is, it's not so much in the dilemmas where you can't have right or wrong, but in the instances that you can Mm -hmm. have right or wrong, can we be right about that? I think that's what he's... Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that, from the get-go, that's, that's what he says, I mean, that, that this book isn't contending that we will have answers to all moral dilemmas or all moral questions that we, that right. we have. Uh, but the fact that we will be able to source a finite amount of answers mm -hmm. towards moral questions, yeah. that is really... Uh, the crux of this. And, but I just I felt like it was appropriate to bring that part of the chapter up because it, it is the one that made me raise a brow and, and think, can we really be right about right or wrong? Right. I mean, you can go down the, the philosophical rabbit hole and define, well, what do I know? How can mm -hmm. I actually know it? If it is right, can I be right? If I know it, is it too subjective, objective? I mean, sure. Yeah. And you can go down the delightful rabbit hole, as it were. Yeah. Um, but for the premise of his argument, I, I'll concede it, that you know, when we come up with right or wrong, we can't actually be right about it. Mm -hmm. There's an objective quality to it. And even in the theist circles, we look at it and go, you know, when we look at whether or not this is right or wrong, we assume we are right about it when we come to that conclusion. Now, Harris is going to have a problem with some of the religious avenues that get to that right or wrong. Sure. But we both come to the thought that whatever decision we come to, yes, that can be right. And his method, I would concede, would lead you to something that would say at the end, yes, I am right. As we found with our previous episode in episode seven, Shane and I get into lengthy conversations when we talk about good and evil with Sam Harris's moral landscape. To make this a bit more accessible for those that take our podcast on the go, we've decided to break up this episode yet again into an A and B episode. So this will conclude our first half of the episode for good and evil. You will find the second part of this in episode 8B. But you, if you want the entire episode, uh, whether in uh, was it SoundCloud, yeah, we'll SoundCloud. Um, SoundCloud or on YouTube, you will find those in their entirety. We hope you've enjoyed.
Godspeed.